Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Chicken litter and all. You know you are in the country when you come to church and before you even get in the parking lot, that's what you smell. I told people this is a special place. You can't get this aroma everywhere. We're talking today's the message is, is about what you see and how you see treasure, how you look at things. And, and I, I commented to somebody that for most of us as we came and, and we smell this aroma and you may have seen the effects of it in the nearby fields to the farmers and those people not having to pay for additional fertilizer, this looks and smells like money. So it's, it's how you look at things because how you see things determines what value you put on them and what is treasure to you or not. I'm so glad to be back here today. My wife and I have traveled for a few days, had a great time together. We, we did a wonderful cruise and had a, just a marvelous time. We ate way too much, I will admit that. And I felt somewhat guilty about that. And then I was researching scripture and I found out that cruising and eating at the buffets is actually in the Bible. It's scriptural. <laughs> I'm going to help some of you out. In 1 Corinthians 9, 27, Paul said, I buffet my body. When I did a little research, the word, it's spelled the same, but it's buffet. means to discipline my body. I, I thought I had something there to begin with. But as we were on there, and I noticed as we had opportunity to eat pretty much 24-7, if you wanted to, that one of the reasons we ate as often as we did, as much as we did, is because our eyes could see it all the time. There were what, like at least three buffet lines, different places, and plus the, all the specialty restaurants and the pizzas. And listen, I hadn't even thought about ice cream. And one day I saw a guy walking by with the little ice cream cone about like that. And I kid you not, my wife will verify, and he had ice cream piled up about this high. He was walking like this. And I didn't even want ice cream until I saw ice cream. So our eyes will determine what we pursue and what we deem to be treasure. Go with me to Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 22 for the introduction. Jesus here says these words. He said, your eye is like a lamp. And I want you to think in those terms as we go through the message today. We've been in the series about treasure and where your treasure is and having treasure in heaven versus earthly treasure and think about the concept of our eyes and how powerful they are. Jesus said, your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. If you can see clearly where you are going, then your body is in pretty good shape as it relates to where you're trying to go. But then he says, if your eye or when your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, and by the way, the King James translates this, says when your eye is single or la literally laser focused, you can see clearly. He said, that's a wonderful thing. And it says when your eye is unhealthy, the King James says when it is evil, your whole body is filled with what? Darkness. And now he's going to make a really, really good point here. He said, and if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Part of the reason as we look around in the world today and we see people engaged in certain activities, behaviors, and demeanors, and we say, how in the world can people behave that way and act that way? They think they are walking in light, but they are walking and living in darkness, and they don't know any different. You can't see what you can't see until somebody turns on the light for you so that you can see more clearly. 
I remember it's been, I don't know, several months ago. I got up early in the wee hours of the morning, which is not uncommon, and I wanted to go to my office to read and do some studying. I didn't want to wake my wife, and as I made my way out of the bedroom to go to the other end of the house where my office is, I thought I was seeing some light illuminated from where my office area is, and I just quietly walked through to go out, and I did not realize what I thought was light was the white part of the door that I thought was wide open that had closed two-thirds of the way. And I was introduced to the corner of that door. Now, my wife got woke up not by me bumping into the door, but by the response <laughs> of bumping into the door at 4 o'clock in the morning. He said, in the light you think you have is actually darkness. If that's the case, how deep the darkness is. Go with me to Matthew chapter 20, we're going to look at some, some variations of a healthy eye and an unhealthy eye and let the scripture speak to us today. In Matthew chapter 20, the story here, Jesus is sharing a parable with the people around him and he says the kingdom of heaven is like and he goes into this parable and he's talking about a guy who owns a vineyard and he goes out to hire people. Interesting, go back and read the whole story. He hires people very early in the morning. He hires people at 9 o'clock a.m., at 12 noon, at 3 p.m., and at 5 p.m. And then we pick the story up in verse 8 of Matthew 20. He says, that evening, which happens to be 6 p.m., they had a long work day. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and to pay them, beginning with the last workers first. So he's hired all these five different groups of people at different times in the day from early morning to late afternoon. And at the end of the day, he calls the people who were hired last and he's going to pay them first. Now, the, the point of this parable that we're going to look at today is when your eyes are comparing yourself with other people, it's always going to create problems for you. And the first comparison that they get this opportunity to look at is the people who got hired last at 5 p.m. in the afternoon, only worked an hour, and they get called to get paid first. You would think that the people that went out early in the morning would get paid first, but that's not what Jesus did. This parable is extremely interesting. We're going to learn that what God chooses to do is his business and not necessarily ours. Another good lesson I hope we learn is what other people do with what belongs to them is their business and not ours. Stay with me. Verse 9 says, And when those hired at 5 o'clock were paid, each received notice, a full day's wage. I'd like to be in that group, wouldn't you? And when those hired first, which was very early in the morning, came to get their pay, notice they assumed comparison your eyes when you compare with other people you're always going to make wrong assumptions people who live on your street that seem to have the biggest house and the nicest biggest fastest boat and all the toys and you think their life's all together you don't know they're drowning in debt if they miss one paycheck they're going to lose everything You don't know that there's so much stress in the household over meeting their monthly and weekly obligations that their relationships are upside down. But when you look at them with that kind of eye and make comparisons, you make wrong assumptions. Come on. And when you look at people and you're like, well, poor thing, they're driving a 15-year-old car. They've been in that house 35 years. It's never been remodeled. But listen, I guarantee you, if their stuff's paid for, they're a whole lot more happier and content than you ever will be. Yeah. Don't get caught up in the eyes of comparison. Let's read on. It says, they assumed they would receive more, but they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, notice, they protested to the owner. When you compare yourself with other people and look through those eyes, you are always going to find fault and be angry and upset at somebody, including God. Oh, this is good stuff today. If you can't tell, I've been pinned up for two weeks and I'm ready to go. <laughs> Verse 12. Those people... Worked only one hour, they said, and yet you've paid them as much as you paid us who worked all day. And notice they add this element, in the scorching heat. 
There has been zero mention in this whole story and parable about the heat or the weather conditions the whole day until now. That's very important. Why is that? Because when you look through eyes of comparison and you're not getting treated like you think you should and somebody else is getting a better deal than you, you are always going to embellish the facts of the matter of the case and make things seem worse than they are. Let me, let me move on. Verse 13. He, the owner, answered one of them and he responded to them. This is the term. He didn't even say, worker. He said, what? Friend. See, he's trying to keep it on a personal, cordial level. He said, friend, I haven't been unfair. Did you agree to work all day for the usual wage? The answer would have been yes when they got hired. Take your money and go. I love that. that listen, I'm going to give you the, the J modern day translation. He literally was saying, shut your mouth, mind your business, and move on down the road. <laughs> he said, I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. And he asked this question, is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Do I need to say it again? What other people do with what God's blessed them with is their business, not yours. And vice versa. He said, should you be, here it is, should you be jealous? They had jealous eyes. The whole message is about the eyes lead you to what you determine to be treasure, either in this life or eternally. He said, should you be jealous because I am kind to others? And the answer obviously is, no, they shouldn't, but they were. Eyes of comparison, eyes of jealousy are the exact opposite of what the nature of God is. In fact, James 1, 5 says it this way. He says, if you need wisdom, ask our, and he gives this description Listen, the wisdom isn't the only thing he's talking about in this description. He's giving us a, a description of who God is and what God's nature is. Ask our, what kind of God? Generous, generous God. Ask our generous God. But when you and I look through eyes of comparison and eyes of jealousy, we cannot be generous while we are comparing and being jealous at the same time. Go with me to Deuteronomy, Old Testament book. Deuteronomy 15, beginning at verse 7. These are instructions given to the Israelites all the way back under Moses' leadership as it relates to eyes of generosity. He said, but if there are any poor Israelites, now Israelites being God's chosen people, Israelites were a nation, a, a, a tra traveling nation at the time. They were all kin in some shape, form, or fashion. He said, if there are any poor Israelites, meaning people who had notice, and I'm saying this intentional, that had legitimate needs. Could spend an entire message on that, but we don't have time. He said, if there are any of these poor Israelites in your towns, notice, when you arrive in the land the Lord your God is giving you, they're in transition, going to leave the wilderness, going into the promised land, a place of abundant resources, blessings, the land flowing with milk and honey. And God said, when you get there, when you arrive and get to a better place than where you currently are, he said, don't forget the people who have legitimate needs around you. I, I love this where he says when you arrive. We, we might use the term when your ship comes in. You're familiar with that term, aren't you? I had breakfast with, with a, a, a wonderful I, I consider friend a while back 
And we, got, we had our breakfast time together, and I had invited them, and so I was going to pay for the breakfast, and they snatched the check away from me and said, no, I'm paying for that. I said, well, I was going to pay for it, and I invited you. They said, no, and this is what the person said to me. They said, my ship hadn't come in, but I had a canoe to come in yesterday. <laughs> he said, I want to get it while I can. He said, but when you arrive, when you get to a better circumstance and situation than you used to be in. Let me ask this question. How many of you, be honest, how many of you are better off in most areas of your life, including financially, than you were 10, 20, 30, or 40 years ago? Come on, let's be honest. Some of you didn't raise your hand because you're scared I'm going to ask something of you. <laughs> well, to a degree, you have arrived. You say, well, I don't have the resources like some people have. I don't, I don't even have what you have. Stop comparing. Don't look through those eyes. He says, when you have arrived, notice, do not be hard-hearted or cold-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Instead, be generous. And it depends on how you see people and how you see their needs. It determines how you respond. He said, and, this is in addition to, be generous when you have the opportunity. That's on a day-to-day -day basis. But then there are specific circumstances. He says, and lend them whatever they need, not what they want. Big difference. What they need. Do not be mean-spirited and refuse someone alone because the year for counseling debts is close at hand, and you may be wondering, what is he talking about? I'm glad you want to know because I'm going to tell you. Look quickly at Deuteronomy 15, back up to verse 1. He gives a specific insight. This was for the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, to operate under the system. He said, at the end of every seventh year, you must cancel the debts of everyone who owes you money, how many of you would like to be operating under that system now? <laughs> you would if you owed it, but you wouldn't if they owed you the money. Truth. Perception. But God had this plan in, in place for a reason and a purpose. He said, this is how it must be done. Everyone must cancel the loans they have made to their, notice, fellow Israelites. This was for the Jewish people, their kinsmen, their fellow worshipers. They must not demand payment from their neighbors or their relatives, meaning after the seven-year period, that designated time. Now listen, in case you're wondering and say, well, I wouldn't have borrowed money until the sixth or the seventh year anyway. That way I just make a few payments and I'd be, that's not what he's talking about. If, if you borrowed X amount of money and you had seven years to pay it back, then the payment would be that much lower. If you borrowed it two years out, then your payment's going to be that much higher. Is everybody tracking with me? So he, he did not have a system where people could scam people out of. He was talking about legitimate hardship circumstances beyond people's control and ability to repay and you got to that seventh year they were to be forgiven the note was to be wrote off and wiped clean notice why he said for the Lord's time of release has arrived do you I, listen I'm convinced the reason he put this in place had more to do with the people finding a time of release in the Lord that were owed the money to them than the people who owed the money to them. Track with me. Let me give you a practical true story illustration. Probably, oh, going back probably 30 years ago or so, there was a family that came to my wife and I and wanted to borrow money. I was opposed to it. My wife really didn't want to do it, but because of the circumstances, the situations, she said, I think we need to do this. We loaned the people, I'm talking about 30 years ago, we loaned the people thousands of dollars that represented most of what we had in savings at the time. The promise was the money would be repaid in, thir I think it was 90 days, if, if memory serves me correct. 90 days, they were going to be coming into some money, and they were going to pay all the money back. And we were like, okay, we did it. We loaned the money, and the 90 days came and left, and nothing. 
couple months went by, nothing. Finally, we saw the people. We said, hey, we, we really need to recoup that money. The people made an attempt. They paid some of the money and left thousands of dollars owing. Months went by again. We saw them. We had another conversation and said, hey, we actually have a need now. We need that money back. And they looked at us, and this is what they said. We don't have it. We're never going to have it. We're not going to be able to pay you back ever. Mm. If you know me, <laughs> you'd have been better off to spit in my face. And listen, I struggled with that in my spirit, in my heart. I didn't want to struggle with it, but I did. I was angry. I was bitter. I had resentment in my life. And, and I, I did pretty good on the outside until these people bought a brand new vehicle. I wanted to be the repo man. <laughs> and all of that that I had been dealing with and struggling with, listen, I'm just being transparent and honest with you, came boiling back to the surface, and I didn't realize how much it was affecting my life with my wife and with my children and with my service to God. But listen, I had to pray through, and I got to a point where I did what this said, for the Lord's time of release had arrived not only for them, I forgave them. I wiped it off the books, and God set me free. I'm talking to some people in this house right now that the Lord's time of release has arrived this day for you. There are some people that owe you, and I'm not even talking about money. They have hurt you, harmed you, walked out on you, mistreated you, abused you, neglected you. Lied to you, manipulated you. And they owe you a debt they can never repay. And I'm telling you, today is the day of the Lord's release for you and for them. Let it go. Let it go! Isn't that a song? I just, I just don't know why that came to my mind. Because the Lord's day of release is for the person who owes and for the person who is owed. And some of you, like me, are struggling in your minds and your spirit and your emotion and you can't get clarity of thought, you can't find rest, and you don't know why you're not hearing clearly from God. I'm telling you, the Lord's day of release has come for you today in this house. Back to our passage, verse 9 of 15, Deuteronomy. He says, don't be mean-spirited and refuse a loan because the, the year of canceled debts is close at hand. If you refuse to make the loan and notice and the needy person cries out to the Lord, uh, you will be considered guilty of being a bad neighbor. A bad kin person. That's not what it says, is it? He said, if, if you are better off than you used to be and you see a legitimate need and you close up your heart and you don't help people and have a spirit of generosity and they go to the Lord for, for help and deliverance because you've already passed them by. I didn't say it. He said it. He said you will be considered guilty of sin. That's a strong passage, isn't it? Let the Holy Spirit deal with you according to the way he wants to speak to you. Let's look at another unhealthy eye illustration. Let's talk about Samson for just a few minutes. Judges 14.1. Samson, as you may recall, was one of the, quote, judges, the leaders of Israel during that time span. In fact, 20 years, Samson was a judge over Israel. He was, a, he was like the leader of the people. If you ever went to Sunday school, you know he had supernatural strength and God used him in a miraculous way to do mighty things and destroy the, the Philistines, the, the enemies of God. But Samson had a huge problem with the way he saw things that led him to decisions that got him out of the will of God and the plan and the purpose of God and cost him dearly. Judges 14.1 gives us some insight 
It says, one day when Samson was in Timnah, which is a city under Philistine control, one of the Philistine women, notice what the scripture says, caught his, what? We're talking about eyes of your treasure today, how you see things, including people. And when he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine. Now, we already know they were heathens and pagans, and they hated the Israelites. But he saw her with his eyes, and he let his eyes determine his decisions. That seldom ever ends well. says, she called my eye. And notice now he's going to make this stupid decision. I want to marry her. He hasn't dated the woman yet. He hadn't been around her long enough to know how she responds to certain circumstances and situations. All he knows is she's hot. (laughs) And I want to marry her. He wasn't in love. He was in lust. And there's a big difference. He said, I want to marry her. And then it's what does he had the audacity to say to his mom and daddy, get her for me. Do you know what this tells me, gives me insight at this point in Samson's life? He's still living at home and don't even have a job. (laughs) And he's talking about getting married. Verse 3, his father and his mother objected because they know better. My God. If we would learn to rely on the wisdom of other people who have already seen your similar circumstance before, we would avoid a lot of pain and suffering in this life. His father and mother objected, isn't there even one woman in our tribe or among all the Israelites, talking about the entire country? You sense when you're telling me there ain't at least one girl in this whole, the whole country of the Israelites, ever how many, two or three million there were at the time, that you can't find one woman among all of them. Listen, here's part of the problem. When you look with those kinds of eyes, you all of a sudden are oblivious to every greater opportunity around you because you have blinded yourself with your eyes. They said, why must we go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? But Samson told his father. He's no longer asking his father. He now told his father. He has moved to disrespect and demanding because of what he has seen. Sometimes our attitudes and our demeanors, the reason we're so hateful and mean is because we are looking with eyes that don't please God and therefore we put demanding judgments on other people. Well, that's going to be one you want to share with other folk, I tell you. Samson told his father, get her for me. See the exclamation behind it? I'd like to tell you what I would tell Samson as my son right now, but we got to move on. And notice the reason behind it, because she's a godly woman, because she prays and intercedes for people. She serves and volunteers for other people and gives of her time. She's precious and loves everything that God's created. Any of those reasons show up in here? No. Because she lives good to me. (laughs) 
trophy wife. <laughs> trophy life, horrible wife. I got my wife said, be careful. Now, between this part, I, I want you to see when we look with the wrong set of eyes, listen, it's not just the flesh. The flesh is a big part of it. But when you look at anybody, anything with eyes that covet or lust or desire more than you do God, it's going to be problematic. And after this chapter, in chapter 16, we see that Samson goes and sleeps with a prostitute. Because he was looking with his natural eyes. Then later in that chapter, he falls, quote, in love with another heathen woman by the name of Delilah. Now, believe it or not, Samson married the first girl that we just talked about. And on the wedding celebration, they got into a, <laughs> they got into a big argument. Because Samson had presented a rizzle, riddle and put a big wager, a big bet on it out to all the people for 10 days, the scripture says consecutively, that she aggravated the life out of him. Until he told her the answer and she told the people, he got so mad he left her there. Went back home with mom and daddy and the scripture says that she was given later in marriage to the guy who was his best man in the wedding. You don't need reality TV. You just need to read the Bible. <laughs> You're like, are you serious? That's the story. That's 100% the story. Go back and read it. And so then he meets and falls in love with Delilah, who was from, the scripture says, Sorek, S-O-R-E-K. That is a border town, geographically, that divided the Philistines, the wicked, evil, heathen people, and divided the Israelites where they were residing at the time. It was a border town, and that's where he met her. This is the same Delilah who would sell him out for money not long into the story. I've never paid attention to this before till this week. She lived on the border. He should have expectations of the woman who lived deep in the Philistine territory that she was of little value to him as it related to his walk with God. But she was on the border. She could step one foot over here and one step over here, and he was now content with that. But can I tell you, people who are walking the fence in their relationship with God will eventually sell you out. Mm. I'm not just talking about people you may be thinking about marrying. I'm talking about people you pile out with, spend your time with, spend your money with that you all wrapped up in those relationships, I'm telling you, if they're not deep into God's territory, the best thing is for you to put some distance between you and them. Samson was called and anointed and gifted by God to be a judge over Israel. He had supernatural strength to deliver the nation of Israel from their enemies, particularly the Philistines. He had a unique gift and calling and anointing on his life. But listen, with that gifting, that calling, that anointing, also came some unique challenges and responsibilities and requirements on the other hand. I'm about to speak to another group of people right now. You want to operate and flow in the gifts of the Spirit and the power and the presence of God. You want God to anoint you and to bless your life. He's more than capable of providing that for you, but on the other hand, he's going to put some requirements and expectations on your life and how you live. Mm. I'm not talking about earning your salvation by work, so don't you misunderstand me and go out of here and say I said that because that's not the case at all. 
he was operating and living under what was called a Nazarite vow. Scripture says it was placed upon him from birth. Most instances in the Bible, Nazarite vow was voluntary. It was for a specific period of time. might last for days, weeks, or months. The people, they could not eat grapes, raisins, drink grape juice, uh, wine created from that. They could not touch a dead body, animal, or human in any shape, form, or fashion during that Nazarite vow time. And they could not cut their hair during that time. Scripture says that... Samson was called and gifted and anointed by God from birth to operate under the Nazarite vow. And as a result, his hair had never been cut. And so this is the condition in which we find him when we get to verse 17 of Judges 16. It says, and the story has been that Delilah, on three previous occasions, the woman that he thinks that he loves and thinks that she loves him, three previous occasions, he has told her what the secret of his strength is so the Philistine army can pay her off so that she can get all this money so that he will be in bondage and slavery and the Israelites can be defeated as a nation. Listen, he was the man standing in the gap of protection and safety for the entire nation during the time that God had called him. You may be the only person standing in safety and protection and deliverance for your household and your family right now. So stop looking with fleshly, earthly eyes at your treasure here on this earth and say, God, how do you want me to live and operate? What do you want me to do with my life? Because somebody's depending on you. And it's with this gift and calling, anointing, and three times she, she has, listen, on three occasions, how stupid can Samson be? He has shared his, quote, quote, secret, teasing her. And on three occasions, he'd go to sleep. She had Philistines hidden in the closet, hidden in the other rooms of the house. They came out and did to him whatever he said would rob him of his strength. And then she'd say, the Philistines are upon you. He'd stand and shake himself. Superhero. Three times. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking like me. How can he be so dumb? Before you condemn him, I'm going to give you an answer. It's because with the eyes for which he looked through. You and I make some really, really, really bad and poor choices and decisions every day in our life when we look through the wrong eyes at the circumstances around us. And on this fourth occasion... She has got him to, to finally tell. Look at verse 17. said, And finally Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut. He confessed, For I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and become as weak as anyone else. And Delilah realized he had finally told her the truth. So she sent for the Philistine rulers. Come back one more time, she said. For he has finally told me his secret. So the Philistine rulers returned with the money in their hands and Delilah lulled Samson to sleep. Stay in there with him. We're almost done. He went from desirous, lustful, got to have it at any cost, eyes, to sleepy eyes that are blinded to the circumstances around him. Listen, church, I don't care how long you've been a Christian, how long you have followed Jesus. When you start looking through with the wrong eyes and pursuing things that you think are earthly treasures but have no heavenly value, and you start making poor choices and decisions, eventually your eyes are going to become closed and oblivious to what's going on around you, and the enemy is about to capture you. It said, Delilah lulled Samson sleep with his head in her lap and then she called for a man to come in and notice shave off the seven locks of his hair. Hair had never been cut. Obviously he had a lot of hair. I don't know if it was braided. I don't know if it was in ponytails. I don't know if it was... I don't know what it was in, but it was seven units of it. He must have been a very deep sleeper. She called a man in to shave off the seven locks of his hair, and this way she became she began to bring him down. 
See, the enemy is not going to get to most of us just walk up and say, hey, I'm the devil, I want you to do this. You say, no. But if he can just get you to get your eyes in the wrong direction long enough, start pursuing things outside the will, plan, and purpose of God for your life, that's the process to start bringing you down. And his strength left him. This is the most scary part of this story for me. To realize that I and you, like Samson, can once have the gifting and blessings and power and favor and anointing of God on your life and look through wrong eyes long enough and pursue earthly treasure that causes you to lose what God has gifted to you. Hmm. God help us. She cried out in verse 20, Sab, son, the Philistines have come to capture you. When he woke up, notice, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. The Spirit of God has sent me to tell somebody in this house today, you better deal with God and get some things right today or you're going to be bound in a way that you cannot get free of. He said, I'm going to do like I've done all of these previous years because God loves me. He's blessed me. He's equipped me. He's gifted me. He's anointed me. And now there's a problem in my way and I'm under attack and my people are under attack. I'm just going to get up and do business like I've always done and shake myself and God's going to be upon me. And the answer is no, wrong answer. He was not. But he didn't realize that the Lord had left him. My prayer this week is, God, don't ever let me get so distracted with what I see and how I respond and choices and decisions I make. That you take your giftings and your anointing and your presence and your power away from me. But it can and will happen depending on how we see and respond to earthly things. Verse 21, it gets worse. The Philistines captured him and they gouged out his eyes. The very gifts of God to him, his sight, that he abused was now the very thing that he's going to lose permanently. Here's what I know from personal experience. If you continue to look through the wrong eyes and seek wrong treasure, there's coming a time you're going to lose something in your life that you're never going to get back. Something that God has blessed you with and gifted you with that one day you will long. You said, if I could give anything to go back and make a different choice, a different decision, I would. But it's gone. It's not coming back. Somebody needs to hear me this morning. They took him to Gaza, that's deep in Philistine territory, where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. What he initially thought was great treasure becomes his great tragedy in his life. If that were the end of the story, it would be a most sad story. But I'm speaking right now to the people that you're, you're listening to me, and this message 
is deep in your heart and your spirit and the Holy Spirit is dealing with you. And the devil's whispering to you right now, you've gone too far, you made too many poor choices and decisions. You just, well, continue down this road and look for and pursue the earthly treasure that has gotten you away from God. You've lost too much to recover, to regain. I stand here to tell you that's a lie of the enemy. Today is your day of opportunity to return back to God. Look at verse 22 of that same chapter. After all of this tragedy, verse 22 says, But before long his hair began to grow back. He's never getting his eyes or his sight back. But in God's graciousness, his hair begins to grow back, which means his strength. His strength is coming back. How many people in here need to be strengthened in an area of your life today? There may be some things you're not getting back and you've already maybe come to that realization, but here's what I'm telling you. God's not, God's not done with you yet. Every day, slowly but surely, his hair began to grow and his strength begin to return and even though he's never going to see again God is so gracious that he's still he's still going to use him again mm. can I tell you I would never be on this platform speaking to you today if it weren't for God's grace and mercy in allowing me to be used again God's not done with you yet. His hair began to grow back. Verse 28. Samson prayed to the Lord. No matter who you are, what your circumstance, your situation, where you are with God today. Today, this moment, this hour is your opportunity to pray and call out to God because He's here to meet you. I wish you could feel it as strong as I feel it this morning. Don't you be a fool and walk out of here today and not meet with God. He's here to meet you where you are. Samson prayed to the Lord and he said, Sovereign Lord, remember me again and oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. God's got one more time in it for you. Stand with me in this place today. <laughs> Father, we come into your mighty presence right now. We are overwhelmed by the power of your Holy Spirit in this place. That you would choose this moment, this day, this hour to share this challenging message about the treasures that we are creating and the things that we are looking and challenging us to be generous in our spirits and our hearts and our minds and with our eyes to see people with love and compassion. And you've also challenged us not to pursue earthly treasure that is based solely upon what looks good to us. And you have clearly demonstrated that when we look and pursue the wrong things, we get out of your plan, your purpose, your will for us, and we often pay a great price. But I thank you that you've reminded us it's never too late. We've never gone too far. That you are here to meet with us and to restore us 
that when we call out to you and pray in earnest, you'll meet us. You'll give us strength. You'll use us one more time. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to ask you right now. The Spirit, Spirit of God's heavy in this place. You'll be honest with God. And you say, I've pursued some treasures I thought were treasures. They've turned into tragedy. I've paid a great price. I don't know what it looks like for you. It's not my business. I'm not your judge. But you realize today you need to get your eyes on Jesus. You need to return to the fold. You need to make right choices, decisions based on eternal treasure rather than earthly treasure. That's you. I want you to raise your hand. I know it. Yes. How many of you would be honest and say, I've not always fulfilled the first part of this message and looked with a generous eye to the needs of the people and I've arrived as it relates. I'm better off than I used to be and I want to be generous. I want to be loving. I want to be compassionate to other people and you need God's help to do that. Let me see your hand. Right, where are you? Yes, all of us all over this place. Do you have a healthy eye today? If so, you're walking in light. If your eyes are unhealthy, physically, mentally, relationally, spiritually, you're in darkness. God's here to meet you. There's some people, your life is going to look different moving forward as you respond in faith. I'm going to ask you all to come to these altars this morning. Spend some time in prayer that God would give us healthy eyes to see, and to respond, and to love, and to care. And for those of you who think it's too late, it's not. The hair is about to grow back out, as it were, in this story. God's here to meet you. Call out to God. Repent. Confess. He's going to meet you and minister to you and use you one more time. Would you come and pray now as they sing? These altars are open. Come.